Okay, this second lecture is uh, gravitational waves, but uh, the gravitational waves uh, detector as part of a global detector. So as part of uh, um, a global detector done by uh, high energy satellite, telescopes from the radio to the optical side. So I will talk about multi-messenger astronomy and uh, all the opportunities and the challenges of the next years. We will focus mainly on transient gravitational wave signal because uh, these ones are the most promising for multi-messenger studies. And so this uh, is uh, what uh, we saw yesterday, the most promising uh, sources of uh, transient gravitational wave signal are coalescence of compact objects, so neutron star and or black hole binaries, and core collapse of massive star. And uh, also yesterday we saw that uh, the coalescence of compact objects are more promising in terms of uh, energy emitted and also rate with respect to the core collapse of a massive star. Again, uh, the slide of yesterday that show you the rate. So yesterday we said that the rate had very, very uncertain, but uh, uh, if we believe to the most likely rate, we will have uh, more or less one event per week uh, when the uh, LIGO and Virgo will uh, see the sky as a network in full sensitivity. Today we will focus on neutron star, neutron star, neutron star black hole, and not black hole, black hole, because black hole, black hole, stellar mass black hole, black hole, are not expected to emit, gravitation, to emit uh, electromagnetic emission. So we will focus on these two class of objects. And here is, uh, I repeat again, is the, the distance up to which LIGO and Virgo will see this object when they will be in full sensitivity. This distance is an average in the sky that takes into account uh, the uh, sensitivity of the detectors in the sky that is a bit different in the different part of the sky. And it's also an average on the system of orientation. For the core collapse of, of massive star, we, we said yesterday that uh, the energy emitted, the waveform, are more uncertain. We expect uh, less energy emitted in gravitational waves. And so the majority of the model expect these sources in the local galaxies. And there are some optimistic scenarios, some optimistic models, for which we can arrive also to 10, 100 megaparsecs. These events are very energetic events and they're also expected to emit electromagnetic emission and they are linked to the gamma ray burst. I don't know how many people are familiar with gamma ray burst, but I will give you an introduction on them, on this object. And uh, kilonovi and supernovi. And we will talk about uh, these objects today. Why it is very important to, uh, to try to find, to try to, to see the electromagnetic counterpart signal when we have uh, a gravitational wave signal? First of all, because uh, when we will have the first event, uh, it will be very important to, see, to say, this is the object, this is the astrophysical sources that uh, emit uh, this object, and so to it will be a confirmation of the fact that we are really uh, find something uh, that is uh, an astrophysical sources. Another thing is uh, that uh, to discover an electromagnetic counterpart means also to have a better sky localization. Yesterday we saw that the gravitational wave detector is not a good uh, sky localization. And so, uh, if we are able to find the electromagnetic counterpart, we are able to reduce and to know exactly what is the sources, and so also to know what is the host galaxies of our, of our signal. And uh, very, very important is also the fact that uh, we can use all the messenger to understand uh, our object. And, uh, Gravitational wave and electromagnetic uh, uh, messenger provide uh, 
um, insight into a complementary physics because uh, electromagnetic give us information on the environment, so temperature, density, and also we can look redshift. And uh, on the other side, gravitational wave give us uh, direct information on spin, mass, uh, and also distance. Another thing for which is very important to have an, electro an electromagnetic counterpart is that um, yesterday we saw that in the case of binary system, we can make uh, an analysis that allow us uh, to know all the parameters of the system. And so if we know the electromagnetic counterpart, we can fix some of these parameters. For example, we can fix uh, the distance, we can fix the orientation. And so these allow a better estimation of all the other parameters. And now there is also a very important study that start uh, uh, to try to understand uh, how to use both information to constrain uh, very important uh, things like the neutral, neutral star equation of state. And I will come back on this point later. And uh, so we will open really a new window and we have also this possibility to put together so this, all these uh, different ingredients. So now we will see more detail what we expect from these uh, sources from an electromagnetic point of view. And I will start with the gamma ray burst. So gamma ray burst were first seen around in the 70s and at the beginning by military and are this uh, very brief, sudden, and uh, very, very intense flash in the gamma ray. And uh, the duration go from few milliseconds to hundreds of seconds. The band is typically so uh, hard X, X, uh, and gamma. And uh, these are the flux. A satellite very important was uh, BATSI to understand uh, this, uh, this type of object because BATSI shows that this object that happened more or less uh, with the current satellite, we see them uh, more or less one, one per day of this event, show that these objects are distributed in a uniform way and so that uh, they are of extragalactic origin. Another big step to understand the gamma ray burst was done by Beppo Sachs. This is a, a really very good example on how much uh, increase the sky localization is important because uh, with BEPOSAX, BEPOSAX was this satellite, this gamma ray satellite, with also an X-ray satellite. And so when Batsy saw a GRB in the gamma ray point the, uh, the X-ray satellite, and it was able to reduce the error box, very big, that is typical of gamma ray, to uh, a very small error box. And uh, so we were able to identify the first afterglow of uh, a gamma ray burst. And uh, after this, this uh, the, same, uh, the same gamma ray burst, and I will, I will say you in detail what is an afterglow, but it's the emission in the X-ray that happened later with respect to the gamma ray. And uh, with the ground-based uh, telescope, it was also possible to see this object uh, in the optical. So from uh, many degrees, this allowed to pass uh, to uh, have uh, um, object within uh, uh, ArcMin. This is an example of uh, the, what we do today. Today we are able to identify the host galaxy of this, of this object because we are able so to, to see this object in very detail, so to identify the gamma ray burst and then to make a campaign of observation, a multi-wavelength observation that allow us to, to, um, to see this object in all the band, from the radio to, uh, uh, to the X-ray. 
So now, now today we, we know that they are cosmological event and that they emit very high quantity of energy, up to 10 to the 53 hertz. And I told you in really few seconds. So since the beginning, since uh, with BATS, it was uh, clear that uh, there are two populations. This is uh, the bimodal duration distribution, is the duration of this gamma ray. And uh, these are the ones that are called long gamma ray burst, and these are the short gamma ray burst. The long gamma ray burst have a gamma ray duration that is uh, lar larger than two seconds, and the short gamma ray burst shorter than two seconds. These are two populations are different also for their emission. And uh, here the, there is the so-called hardness ratio. It's the ratio between the hard counts and the soft count. So this is the, the two band of BATSI. This is the plot of 10 for BATSI for, for this population here. And so this is the counts in the more energetic band with respect to the counts in the less energetic band. And what you see is that the short gamma ray burst are more hard and the soft gamma ray burst are more soft. So this represents two population of, uh, of events. And how we can explain these two population? Okay, these population are objects come from different progenitors. For the, core, for the long GRB, we have strong observational evidence that they are associated with uh, the core collapse of massive star, because in the same position of the gamma ray, after a time that sometimes is a week, other times is months, we saw in the same position a supernovae. And so this means that these objects are linked to core collapse of massive star. For the, uh, the other, population, the short gamma ray burst, we have uh, no strong uh, observational evidence of their origin. But there are some indication. First of all, we never see associated with this type of object supernovae. And they are typically associated with an older stellar population with respect to the long. And they are typically located at larger distance with respect to the center of the galaxies. And the larger distance with respect to this type of object. This association with the older stellar population and the larger distance from the center of the galaxies is the ones that we expect for binary system of compact object. Because when a uh, binary systems uh, forms, what happens is that there, re that there is uh, some kick velocity that uh, tend to bring them away from the center of the galaxy. And so their position and their also association with this older stellar population let uh, all people think that these objects are associated with the merger of neutron star, neutron star, and neutron star black hole. So the sources of gravitational waves. And uh, a, a big observational proof of this uh, scenario of progenitor will be to discover gravitational waves and uh, a short gamma ray burst together. This is uh, the model that explain uh, their emission. So independently of the progenitors, what happened after the merger or after the core collapse is that uh, uh, we will have a black hole with an accretion disk, or in some cases we will have a magnetar, so a neutron star, a very, very rapid neutron star in a very high 
magnetic field. And uh, we will have a relativistic jet. And uh, in this jet, we, have, we will have internal shocks. And these internal shocks can give rise to our prompt emission, so to the gamma ray emission that uh, I told you before. And this emission lasts seconds less than two for the short, and two 100 seconds for the long. Then this shock, uh, then we have uh, this jet that interact with the uh, surrounding medium, and we have the external shock. And this shock gives rise to the afterglow emission, and the afterglow emission is uh, in all, we can see them in the, it in all the band, optical, X-ray, and radio, and the last hours, days, and months. So, this is what, what happened. We have this uh, merger, or we have a core collapse, and we have, uh, before we have nothing in the sky, then we have an object, and this object disappear very rapidly. And how much rapidly depend on the band. We will see, I, I told you before, because the after, this is an optical emission, an optical images, but, so we are searching for transient, so object that appear and disappear in the sky with uh, different time scales that depends on the band. Another important thing is the evolution with time of the jet. So the jet, this is the afterglow emission. So the jet with time decelerate and at some point it spread sideways here. And so I, I think that I didn't tell you later that the so the, the, um, the emission is very beamed. So when we have the gamma ray, we can see the gamma ray only if the, uh, the jet point to us. And this is uh, true also for the, for the afterglow emission. But after a while, when the jet spreads sideways, so when the jet decelerates and spreads sideways, we can also an observer that is not along the, the jet can see this emission. So you can understand that uh, uh, um, we can have also observer here, not only on axis. So some observer here can see the emission. Uh, the moment in which the jet break give rise to this, uh, to this, these are called like, call, like curves. This is the flux, this is the time. And uh, the moment that the, the jet spreads sideways, so we have this break in, the, in this afterglow emission. And it's extremely important to see this because give us an indication of the beaming angle of this jet. Now I show you this uh, like curves of flux against, uh, against time for different uh, uh, observer. So in this plot are on axis GRB. So all the GRB that are observed along the, the jet. And uh, this is an afterglow emission. And this is the optical. This is this gray here are long gamma ray bars. These here are short gamma ray bars. I reproduce this plot here. This is the region occupied by long gamma ray bars. This is the region occupied by short gamma ray bars. Typically, in the optical band, these are um, the the power. Uh, so the the the, the flux is decays as a power law with time, with time minus alpha, and alpha is between 1 and 1.5. So these are on axis after glow, and these are long, these are short GRB, and uh, before I told you that uh, 
uh, we expect more binary system with respect to, uh, to core collapse event. So we expect more event like this associated to a gravitational waves with respect to these events. We expect more short GRB. And from this plot, you can see that uh, it's really very important uh, to observe this object as soon as possible. This is one day in order to try to detect them. Here, I put a three telescope. This is the Paloma, Paloma Transient Factory. This is uh, the VLT survey uh, telescope. And this is uh, LSST, a future synoptic uh, uh, um, survey. These uh, are, uh, I think, uh, some of the projects that uh, will uh, look uh, to this type of sources linked to gravitational waves. These are large field of view telescope. And uh, you can see, for example, for PTF, you can see that you need to observe this object as soon as possible, so within one day in order to, to try to, get, to catch their, their emission. The things became also more difficult in the case of uh, off-axis GRB. So far, there is no off-axis GRB observed. And uh, because uh, for the on-axis, we are lucky. We, have, we see the gamma ray, and we point the telescope. So we see the gamma ray, and then we, we point the optical telescope, the X-ray telescope, so we can uh, catch the remission because we know where they are. For the off-axis GRB, what, what we do is to make this big survey and try to find them. So it's really mo also more difficult. They are more, more faint, and they are also more difficult. So uh, for the off-axis, these are model, model of afterglows. And uh, again, in the optical band. And these are long. This is the region in, of transition between long and short. And this is a short GRB. These have different uh, features of, uh, of uh, beaming angle, of observing angle. So this is 0 0.3, this is 0 0.6. So 0 0.3, 0 0.6. What you see is that uh, this, uh, this uh, afterglow peak later. And uh, with respect to the one that I showed you before are more faint. So this uh, emission is more difficult to be observed. And we need to wait some days uh, to observe this type of object. So uh, the gravitational wave, we can, we can consider it is uh, isotropic. The, the emission that I showed you before is uh, on axis. This is an emission that we can see of axis. And so we expect that more event associated to a gravitational wave sources will be like this. Because the, the gravitational waves we can see from everywhere. The emission before we can see only if the observer is, is along the, the jet. And here, this emission, we can see this emission from more angle with respect to the, to the beam emission. This is what uh, I told, yeah. The shot. Mm. No, the short are more weaker than the long GRB. And there are two reasons of this. They are intrinsically weaker in, in both cases. So you look here. Here is a. So this is the short, this is the long on axis. In a contrary way. No. So the short, 
No, in the first slide when I show you, the hardness ratio is something different, is, uh, is the how the, the spectra is distributed. So when I say hard, it's because you have uh, an energy that is more at high energy with respect to low energy. That is something different. Here, so in the first one, you can see these are the long and these are the short. So the short are more fainter. And also here, you can see these are the long and these are the short one. So the short are more faint, and there are two reasons for this. One is because they are intrinsically more faint, and also because I told you before, they are typically in a region where the density is lower. And so another reason is that the density is lower. So you have to this region for which the short are fainter. You, I can show you. So I can show these. These is, these are the slide before. This one. Okay, the one, this is something different because you have to evaluate uh, how many photons arrive, but also the energy of them. And so you can have, uh, the, the energy depends also on, the, on how many photons you have. So you have to integrate it over the photons. So this is not directly linked to, to the luminosity and see that this, this one, because they are more energetic, means that uh, you have more flux. This means on, only the distribution of, of, your, of your energy. Yeah. Yeah, and this plot, I think, is very useful to, to see this, because um, all these GRB were observed GRB, and they're all bring to the same distance. And so this plot really gives you an idea of the intrinsic luminosity of this object. It's a bit more clear. Okay. Okay. So these are what I told you before. That uh, these are uh, the uh, what we see for long gamma ray burst. So this is the afterglow emission, and. Uh, there is also the supernovae emission. And so what we see for the long GRB is this bump after a while, sometimes weeks or months. And this is what was observed. And the presence of a supernovae was also confirmed spectroscopically because we see this type of spectra in the same position of the long GRB. This is what uh, we expect in X-ray. So in X-ray, this is, what, uh, this is uh, what we observed on axis with SWIFT. And this is the model of, uh, of axis. These are only short GRB. Also in X-ray, you can see the difference between long and short in terms of flux. And uh, here you can see that also in this case, the off axis are more faint and peak later. For the long GRB, there is also another type of emission that is uh, linked to the supernovae at the beginning. So when there is the explosion of the supernovae, we can have the shock breakout that is typically seen in X-ray and also in UV. And this, uh, this one is, uh, is, uh, can be short few thousand of seconds or long, and so last for some, some days. This is in the radio. So I, I, I go back one second in the X-ray. Also for the X-ray, can, you can see here hours. So it's really very important to observe this object as soon as possible 
after the gravitational waves to, to try to see this type of object. We consider the gravitational wave contemporary to the merger, to the moment of the gamma ray emission that is zero. So the time zero is the time of the gamma ray. This is in radio. In radio, I don't know if you can see here, but this is the radio band, and the radio typically peak later. These are some model curves of, uh, of uh, uh, a radio emission, and typically the radio is after days, after many days. You can see here, we are 100 days later. So we lose the temporal coincidence with the gravitational wave event. Mm -hmm. There is also some model of radio precursors. So when there is a binary system, so there is this model that predicts uh, a radio emission a bit before the merger, that for this dispersion you can see a few minutes after the, the merger. But in reality, uh, people expected many events like this with uh, low far because you can typically see these, these events uh, at uh, low frequency. But up to now, so far, low far didn't see any of them. Uh, there is cali also calibration problems with low far. So uh, about this, uh, I think that we need observation to confirm or not confirm their, their existence. So, about uh, short GRB, so the short, I, we told you, I told you that the short GRB are the most promising sources associated to gravitational waves. So far, we have uh, uh, 100 short GRB, GRB observed. The number of long is higher. And uh, for them, we know uh, the distance for 20, more, more or less. They are typically, the median redshift is around 3 gigaparsec. The most nearby was uh, at uh, um, 500 megaparsec. For us, it's really very important to try to understand how many gamma ray bursts can be inside the LIGO and Virgo horizon. And so what people do was this, is to take the um, distribution of uh, GRB, observed GRB. These are on-axis GRB. And uh, to, this is SWIFT, to extrapolate to a, uh, Fermi or Sky Monitor, and uh, to put there the horizon of LIGO and Virgo. And uh, uh, we used, uh, we expect sh that the short GB is associated also to neutron star black hole, so we use uh, the horizon of neutron star black hole. And uh, what you can uh, obtain is that uh, we expect uh, 0.3 short GRB per year when LIGO and Virgo will be in full sensitivity for the neutron star neutron star range or three short GRB per year for neutron star black hole. So these are on axis GRB. So GRB that uh, point to us, that has a jet that point to us. And uh, these events are are rare, but uh, they are very important because uh, this event uh, allow us uh, to make important study. One of them is the one that I show you at the beginning. If these events are, for example, neutron star black hole, we can try to constrain the equation of state of neutron star. And uh, this study of Maselli e Pan uh, Panarale uh, showed that uh, 
uh, only for some parameter space uh, you can have the electromagnetic emission. And in particular, when you have a neutron star and black hole, you can have the electromagnetic emission only when you have a ratio between their mass smaller than three. Because if the, the ratio is larger than three, what happens is that uh, you are not able to create the accretion disk that gives you the jet. Because the neutron star is captured by the, the black hole, and you have no time to make uh, tidal disruption and create this, uh, this uh, disk. And uh, uh, this is also linked to the, to the spin. Uh, higher spin allow you to have an electromagnetic emission because higher spin means uh, shrink the, uh, the last stable orbit nearby to the black hole and is smaller with respect to the tidal disruption orbit. And in terms of uh, equation of state of neutron star, if you have uh, an equation of state that is more uh, uh, stiff, you have uh, a larger radius for your uh, neutron stars, and so you have a larger possibility to have uh, an electromagnetic emission. So looking at the electromagnetic emission and the gravitational waves, you can, on the basis of uh, estimation of the mass of the speed, you can try to, uh, you can, because these works show that you can put constraint on the equation of state of the neutron star. Other work that you can make with this type of object, so on axis GRB, is also cosmology. I don't believe that this is possible with uh, LIGO and Virgo, because this, this event you see are very rare, so it's impossible to have a large sample for this uh, type of study. But what happens is this, that you can have two ways to estimate the distance, because you can have the distance from uh, uh, an electromagnetic point of view, because you can know the, the distance of the galaxies of this object, and uh, so you can have the, the redshift, and on the other side you have a totally different way to estimate uh, the distance that is uh, uh, from the gravitational waves itself. And so these allow you to make cosmology. But you need many, many events to make this. And uh, so LIGO and Virgo, I think, will, will not be used for this, even if, even if there is article that say, yes, it's possible. Uh, I think that the third generation of detector, yesterday I didn't tell you about this, but there is a third generation of ground-based detector, our only project. One of them is uh, the Einstein telescope. will give uh, an improvement in sensitivity of a factor 10, so another factor 10, with respect to the advanced LIGO and Virgo. And uh, this means uh, a larger number of these events. And so with uh, ET, would be possible to make cosmology with uh, these events. So these, uh, again, these are on-axis GRB. We expect more of axis GRB with respect to on-axis. Yeah? You, okay, so, so use them as standard candle with the afterglow. Uh, there is this, uh, okay, more than the afterglow is the prompt emission. There is this uh, uh, hematic correlation that try to make this. But in this case, uh, uh, you can use them uh, in a different way, in the sense that in this case, the standard, ca the standard candle comes from the gravitational waves. And so you, you can use, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and the most easy way to, to est these are at the end uh, are nearby GRB. And so we think that uh, it's easy also to find the galaxy and so have a, have a good estimation of the redshift through the galaxy. 
So this is something that I told you uh, yesterday a bit, that now people try to estimate the number of uh, uh, gravitational wave events using uh, the number of GRB. So GRB observed on axis. Uh, so if you have, uh, if you take the number of uh, GRB observed on axis, you can uh, evaluate the number of uh, neutral star, neutral star merger if you know the beaming angle. So if you know well the beaming angle, you can extrapolate, you can evaluate very well the rate of uh, binary systems. And uh, the problem is that we don't know well the beaming angle. For the short GRB, we have only two observations of, uh, uh, two estimates that come from the observation. One is seven degree, the other is 14 degree. So we, we don't know really the beaming angle. But if we assume different beaming angle, so this is a, an isotropic emission, this is a beaming angle of 10, the rate of gravitational wave event that we expect is from 0 0.2 to 40. This is for the isotropic case, this is for a beaming angle of uh, 10. This is another type of emission that we expect from uh, uh, a binary system. So during the merger, what happened is that uh, we have uh, a significant mass that is uh, dynamically ejected at sub-relativistic velocity. And uh, in this matter, for neutron capture, we have a very heavy element that uh, decay through stability. They hit the material around, and when this material is enough expanded, we can have uh, this emission that is very similar to a supernovae emission, but with a different time scale and with a different luminosity that is called macronovae or kilonovae. And uh, uh, it typically is a transit of a few days. And I show you the, the light curves expected for this object. And uh, when this uh, material interact with the surrounding medium, we can have radio remnants. So very similar to the supernova events, but with different energetic. Uh, this was the, the first uh, uh, simulated light curves for this type of object. You can see here different model. This is, I think, a black hole, black hole, and all these three are uh, sorry, not black hole, black hole neutron star, and these are neutron star, neutron star. So uh, in, uh, in this model, you can see that we have the peak of the light curves after one day, more or less. Uh, and uh, this, mod this simulation used uh, an iron opacity. So the heavy element are, in this case, iron. But... Uh, uh, the simulation also indicated that the element that forms through neutron capture are more heavy than iron. And so now we have a more realistic simulation of this object. And taking into account so these more heavy, more heavy elements, what happened is that this is the light course with iron opacity and this one is the light course for heavy elements. So these, are, these objects are a bit more faint and peak a bit later, after more or less, less eight days, eight, nine days. And uh, the emission, this is iron, this is more heavy than iron, and the emission is more, you can see here, is more in the infrared than in the optical. So we expect more infrared emission than optical. Why I talk you about this object? Because uh, this emission is isotropic, like the gravitational wave. 
And so we expect uh, that the majority of our gravitational wave event will have this uh, signal associated. So the, uh, in 2013, there was uh, uh, a first observational evidence is the only one of a kilonova. So this uh, could be the first kilonova observed. It was not confirmed by, by, other, by other observations, so we are waiting for other observations like this. What happens was this, that uh, there was a GRB, and with the AHST, people observed this GRB after a few days. And after nine days, they, they don't see nothing in the, op in the optical, but they see a transient in the infrared. They see an emission in the infrared. So if you look here, this is the X-ray afterglow. This is the optical afterglow. And these are the point observed in the infrared. So in the infrared, you have this point here. And this point here gives you what we expect as afterglow. And there is a point here. It is the HST point, so this one. So this one is impossible to be explained with an afterglow emission because the power law is this one. And so people say this point can be explained if we assume a kiln of emission. These are two uh, light curves correspond to a different mass for a kiln of emission. So this point uh, is maybe the first evidence of a kiln of emission. But was seen only in this, uh, in this GRB. And so we wait for other of this event because now we have only model of kilonova. So to, to constrain the model, we really need observation of, this, uh, of these events. For the radio, these are what we expect from the simulation of uh, radio remnant coming from these events. But what you can see from the radio is that uh, these uh, transient events are after many years. So two, five years, 1.55. So it's really, in the radio, it's really very complicated to associate it, our gravitational waves uh, with uh, the radio emission because we lose completely the temporal coincidence with our events. So uh, to summarize, we have the gamma ray beam emission in the gamma, and uh, these last uh, seconds. So for us, it's impossible to discover a gravitational waves uh, and ask to the satellite to point in the direction of the gravitational waves because this, uh, this emission lasts uh, seconds. So in this case, we developed uh, an analysis that uh, use the electromagnetic information, so use the information coming from the gamma ray to focus the gravitational wave search. On the other hand, the GRB afterglow emission, the kilonova, are emissions that are expected hours, days after our event, our gravitational wave event. And so we developed a uh, a program that is called the Electromagnetic Follow-Up Program, in which we try to discover the gravitational wave as soon as possible, and to send alert around the world to the, to the uh, optical telescope or the X-ray satellite, and we ask them to observe, to try to find this emission. For the radio, I told you that uh, we lose the temporal coincidence. So what we do is uh, to try to make uh, a high latency follow-up, so to make observation after weeks. Or we can use uh, something similar to this one. So we find the transient in the radio, 
and we look back to our gravitational wave data to, to see if in the same direction there is, there is something in the gravitational wave data. So we start with the first type of search in which we use uh, the electromagnetic observation to focus the gravitational wave analysis. What we do? So uh, what we, we do is this. We use uh, the gamma ray burst time and uh, the gamma ray burst sky position. And uh, we fix uh, this uh, in the gravitational wave search. And so this allows us to reduce the parameter search, the parameter space of our search, and so to gain in sensitivity. We, use, uh, we make this search for the unmodel and also for the compact binary coalescence. This is the place of the trigger where we, f we make the analysis, and year and year we estimate the background. We, uh, we studied about 200 gamma ray bars in this way, and we didn't find any gravitational wave associated to them. This allows us uh, to put uh, upper limit on the distance of this object, and you can, you can see here that uh, these distance are very nearby, and this is the reason why we didn't discover any, we didn't see any gamma ray bars because these gamma ray bars are, are all at uh, a higher distance with respect to this value. So we make also some population study on these. These are the cumulative uh, redshift distribution of uh, our upper limit, the one that I showed you before. This is the region occupied by the observed GRB. And the same for this. This is a, in a model search. This is a binary system coalescence search. You can see these are two plots, one for neutral star, neutral star. This is for neutral star black hole. These, uh, what we, we, we were able to do are very distant with respect to the observation in this case and in this case. But in this plot, there is also what will happen in the future. In the future, we will have an improvement in sensitivity of a factor 10. And we will have also more GRB. We can, we can use, for example, two years of observation of the, of the uh, satellite. And uh, what you can see is that these curves come over here. And also in this case, these curves come over here. So this means that uh, it will be possible to make a detection or in any case uh, to put uh, important constraint on the GRB model. These are other type of, uh, of study that uh, we, we do, we did with the initial Ligon Virgo on some specific event, on some single event. So there were two gamma ray bursts that uh, exploded in the same region of nearby galaxies. One was Andromeda, and the other one, a M81. And so some people thought at the, at the beginning, because we didn't know the redshift of this event, that this event were gamma ray burst in these, two, in these two galaxies. And in this case, gravitational waves help to understand that these events are only background event or are not GRB because no gravitational waves were detected from these two galaxies. And so we were able to exclude the presence of, G of a GRB in Andromeda and the M81. So this uh, gamma ray emission could be compatible with something different with respect to a gamma ray burst that could be a soft gamma ray repeater, for example. Or also these uh, GRB are background GRB that are only in coincidence with our galaxies, but uh, in, sp in spatial coincidence with our galaxies, but not belong to M81 or uh, Andromeda. 
So the uh, use of the electromagnetic information to focus the gravitational wave search can be done also in, in, uh, in uh, not only for GRB, but also for the soft gamma ray repeaters. So if we see soft gamma ray repeaters in, uh, uh, in X-ray and gamma, we can use this information to make uh, the gravitational wave search. The main problem is that uh, in these cases, uh, we don't know the energy emitted in gravitational waves. For different model, we have uh, many, many order of difference. So the energy go to 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 9. But in any case, all the event that we see as soft gamma ray repeaters will be used also with the advanced LIGO in Virgo to see if there is a gravitational wave. This can be done also with uh, uh, core collapse supernovae and also with the pulsar glitches. In these two cases, what give rise to the gravitational wave is the, the pulse after this event that we expect uh, uh, from the object. These are, are typical. These are magnetars and these are neutral stars. These are the glitches. People think that glitches are linked to star quake. Now we go to the second type of, uh, of search, the one that use the gravitational wave signal to ask to the telescope to point and to try to, to detect the afterglow emission. So the first, we did the first uh, uh, electromagnetic follow-up uh, in 2009-2010. And what we did was this, uh, try to identify gravitational wave events in real time and obtain prompt observation. So LIGO and Virgo observed the sky, and uh, there was uh, this search algorithm that tried to identify as soon as possible gravitational wave trigger. They select uh, the more significant with respect to the background, and uh, they ask uh, to the telescope after a human event validation, so there were some people on duty that uh, evaluate the performances of the interferometers, and uh, we send alert uh, to the electromagnetic facilities. And uh, all this was done, so all this process, the software part takes about 10 minutes, and then in 30 minutes we were able to send alerts to the telescope. For the advanced detector HERA, we expect to reduce these 30 minutes to more or less 10 minutes. So we will send alerts in 10 minutes to the, to the uh, electromagnetic uh, observatories. We will try also to reduce this time because I, sh I, I showed you before that these are very uh, fast events in some cases. So it's impost, important to send alert as soon as possible to the satellite and to the, to the telescope at the ground. The main problem is, again, uh, the sky localization. Because we need to say to the telescope where they have to point. And yesterday we saw that uh, the... Uh, that the sky localization is very poor in gravitational waves. In the, the first electromagnetic follow-up, this is an example of, uh, of, uh, of uh, sky localization. And in this case, at, uh, we, we expect low signal-to-noise ratio events. We had uh, 200 square degree or 300 square degree to see. Yesterday, there was a question on the sensitivity. Why the sensitivity? I think the, the guy there. On the sensitivity, why the sensitivity is uh, like, go like the uh, square root of the number 
of, okay, this is the reason, this is formula. So this is a simplistic formula because you assume this is the uh, network signal to noise ratio. And you can see these are the three interferometers. So if, if you assume that the three interferometers had, has the same, uh, has the same uh, sensitivity and uh, as the same sensitivity, and you assume also a Gaussian, a Gaussian noise, you can write this like n sigma, sigma square, and so is like uh, square of n. This is the reason why. It's clearly a simplistic thing because you have not a Gaussian noise. Yeah, at the end is a distance, uh, yeah. 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 So, okay. Uh, I, yeah. Uh, so, again, uh, the sky localization is, uh, so, hundreds of square degree. But here we, we don't have really a telescope with a so large field of view. These are all the telescopes that participate to the first uh, electromagnetic follow-up. And you can see here their field of view. So we have, uh, for example, Quest that has a very big field of view of 10 square degree, but not 100. We have one that have a very, very big square field of view of 400 square degree, but has not a good uh, a good magnitude. So we need to find a very faint object, and we need to have a very, very big field of view. And there are not this type of, uh, of uh, instruments. And so it's important to develop observational strategy for this telescope. And in the past follow-up, what was done is uh, not to observe all the error box of the gravitational waves, but uh, to look at the galaxy. So, so we know what is the volume observed by LIGO Virgo that is uh, not so big. So instead to look everywhere, we can look, uh, uh, we, we looked at, at, the, at the galaxy, at the region occupied by the galaxy. This was, uh, not so difficult in the first follow-up because the horizon was not so big. But you can understand that going to larger and larger volume, the number of galaxies increase. You can try to find some prior in the galaxy. But uh, uh, going to larger distance, this type of strategy became more difficult. So these are the events that we sent to the tele to the so the event, the gravitational wave event that we sent to the, to the telescopes. And we observed eight gravitational wave alerts with optical telescope, two alerts with SWIFT, some in the radius. And uh, I have to say you that uh, mm, we have this uh, low latency search, so a search that is very rapid. But after this search that is very rapid, uh, with the gravitational wave data, we make also a deep uh, analysis that uh, uh, is more uh, uh, precise also in the evaluation of the background. And this uh, longer uh, uh, and deep analysis show us that no one of these uh, events was really gravitational waves, but all of them were compatible with the background. And also from the electromagnetic point of view, all the things that we find in this, uh, in this area were compatible with the background. So the, the background of transient in the electromagnetic part. But this was really a good exercise because uh, uh, show us all the challenges of this type of search. So what, what we have, what uh, people have to deal when they try to find this object is uh, so object that, that, as I showed you before, appear and disappear in the sky. 
very rapidly. And uh, so you have to take uh, multi-epoch images. You have to try to follow their like curves. And uh, another big problem linked to this very big uh, error box is that you need to analyze uh, very big images. And uh, in these very, very large images, you have many, many contaminants. So you have many transients that are not associated to the gravitational waves. So you have to find one event over a thousand and thousand transients. So it's really very complicated. And the main complicated step is so to remove the contaminants. And how you can do this? This can be done uh, by a very deep knowledge of the, tran the transient sky. And uh, what you have to do is to, uh, in a very quick way, using uh, different things like, like course, color, shape, try to remove all the things that you know that are contaminants. And I show you what are the contaminants. So the exploration of the, this is in the optical. The exploration of the optical sky started very recently. In the last 10 years, we had very big improvements. This plot was mainly filled in by the Palomar, Palomar Transient Factory. They discovered all these objects. These are time scales of days. And these are the flux. This is the region expected for the kilonova. The contaminants for our gravitational wave counterpart are mainly galactic. We have asteroids, M dwarf flares, cataclysmic variable, variable star, and also background, AGN and supernovae. Asteroids are the more easy to remove because they move in the images. So if you take multi-epoch images, you see some objects that move and you can remove them. The main contaminants that are these, M dwarf flares and supernovae. I put here some number. In uh, 10 square degree, you have uh, if you, if you make the sum of these two, you have 30, so 100 transient, contaminant transients. So they are a lot. And in many, many square degree, in hundreds of square degree, you can have many of them. I, I have to say that they have different time scales because the M dwarf flares have uh, scales, time scales of minutes, hours, the supernovae, days, months. So if you are able to follow the light course for, for, uh, uh, for a long period, you can uh, uh, discriminate in this object. But the problem is that you are, you, you are trying to find something that is very fast. That is, that, uh, uh, that is a, a very short time, time scale transients. And so we, you need to remove this, this event uh, in a few hours. And so this is the problem. In the optical skies, the, the main problem are these objects. In the X-ray and uh, in the radio, the situation is better from the point of view of contaminants. You have, uh, it's more empty, the sky, in radio and, and X-ray. And so it's, uh, you have really less contamination. Here I put some number. But you have other type of problems. One is that in X-ray, we don't have large field of view. The, uh, the most useful uh, uh, X-ray satellite that uh, we can use for this type of study is SWIFT, that has arc mean field of view. So you have arc mean field of view to image hundreds of square degree. So the problem is the field of view in this case. It is smaller with respect to the optical. 
You can make mosaic, but it's really very hard, and the people are thinking to use this galaxy uh, targeting strategy with SWIFT. In radio, we have very big field of view, also for order of 50 square degree, but in radio, the problem is the temporal coincidence. I showed you before that uh, the radio emission is not coincident with the, uh, with the uh, gravitational wave emission. And so we don't know when we have to observe. And so we cannot observe the sky for uh, weeks, weeks, and weeks up to here. So I think the optical can be one of the most promising place to try to find. And if we, if we will have some large field of view uh, monitor in X-ray, would be also better than the optical. Advanced era, what will happen? Yesterday I showed you the full sensitivity, but to arrive to the full sensitivity, it will keep some, uh, some years. And uh, these are all the steps to arrive to the full sensitivity. Here you can see the, the improvement in the uh, average distance for neutral star, neutral star binary. And uh, we expect full sensitivity around uh, 2019, more or less. So 2019, we will have the full sensitivity. Sky localization. The sky localization will not improve because uh, improve a lot only if we have another detector. And these are the big improvement that we will have and we expect around 2022 with, in this case, there is uh, LIGO India. And we hope also to have uh, CAGRA, and so we can also reduce this error box with CAGRA. So for many years, from now to 2020, we need to deal with uh, error box that are of order of tens to hundreds of square degree. This is a table that summarizes the observing scenario from now to uh, 2020. Here are the uh, estimated run duration. So this year we will have three months of science observation with LIGO, only LIGO. In 2016-17 we will have six months of LIGO and Virgo will join LIGO. And uh, then we will have uh, nine months and so on. Here you can see the maximum distance for a burst. This is a maximum distance for, for a binary system. And these are the expected rate with big uncertainties for, from now to 2020. And these are the percentage of binary neutral star localized within five square degree and 20 square degree for all this year. So big improvement only when we will have uh, a four detector. This plot uh, show more or less the number of uh, expected neutron star, binary neutron star in the next years. And I think that uh, a promising year for the first detection will be 2017. This is uh, uh, linked to this year, a work on what will happen with the observation in 2015. People are trying to use all the information also to, to try to, to improve the sky localization also with only two telescopes. And so uh, there is uh, this uh, software that is called BISTAR. And BISTAR make the sky localization using the triangulation, but try to use also, uh, try to evaluate the 
consistency of timing, phase, and amplitude in the two interferometer. And with this, they are a bit able to improve the sky localization. And uh, for 2015, they expect uh, 500 square degree as median. So I told you yesterday that after uh, this uh, detection search, uh, there is also a full parameter search. And so obviously, if you are able to find the correct parameters, you can also a bit improve the sky localization. And uh, with only two detector, in use this uh, fast sky localization code, this parameter estimation code doesn't help. And so you can see that the blue and the red line are not, uh, are, are give the same results. When also Virgo will be on, and also if Virgo will be in 2016, Virgo will not have a good uh, sensitivity. So also with Virgo, but with a not good sensitivity, the presence of Virgo will improve, in the case of parameter estimation code, will improve the sky localization. And we will have a median of 200 square degrees. So it's really very important that we'll, Virgo will be online the next year. The full parameter estimation is now taking uh, uh, some hours to be run. But people are trying to, uh, to reduce a lot this time, this computational time. So a similar work was done also for burst event. So what are the challenges of this type of searches? We need to find fast transients. We need to deal with very large error box that uh, are difficult to be covered by the telescope. And uh, there are many contaminants. And we will have larger and larger volume to observe. And so I think it's really very important that uh, gravitational wave people, electromagnetic, so astronomers, but also the theoretical community can help on try to identify a, an observational strategy is the best one to try to find this object. So what can be one of these uh, strategy is uh, a, a so-called hierarchical search. So first of all, we need a very, very wide field of view telescope that run over this very big field of view. We need very fast and smart software that are able to rapidly classify the transient and exclude the contaminants. And then we need to use the more expensive telescope, in which it's very difficult to obtain time of, of observation, to characterize. So we need to pass from thousands of transients to 10 candidates, and thus a larger telescope to observe them and study their nature and try to find the electromagnetic counterpart. This was done by the Palomar Transient Factory. They proved the that, that it is possible to do this, this type of search. What they do, so what they, they made, they, uh, so they follow the gamma ray bars observed by Fermi. The gamma ray bars observed by, by Fermi have an error box of order of 70, 100 square degree. So Fermi saw in the sky this gamma ray burst. And with this optical telescope, they try to monitor this region, observe the, the error box of Fermi. They use a machine learning uh, uh, software to remove the contaminants on the base of the shape of the color of the um, the presence or not of uh, object before in the reference images. And uh, they were able to discover uh, over a sample of 35 GRB, eight optical afterglows. 
It's true that uh, the gravitational wave errors are bigger. These are all uh, afterglow, long GRB afterglow, so we expect uh, of axis GRB, we expect fainter object, but uh, this was a great success of PTF that showed that this is now possible. In the, pa in the past, this was not possible because really help a lot the use of this uh, very uh, sophisticated machine learning uh, uh, software. And, uh, but so, it's a challenge, but uh, it can be done. Another thing is uh, also in the removal of uh, the contaminants, uh, a galaxy tar targeting can help. So if we can find some priors in the galaxies, link, I don't know, link to the star formation rate, link to the mass of the galaxies, uh, that uh, allow us to identify the most probable host of the, of the uh, binary system events, we can also look only on the region of the galaxies. And also these uh, allow, help us uh, to reduce this very big error box and to reduce so the, the contaminants events. This is a big of policy of uh, that the LIGO and Virgo collaboration decided. So uh, the LIGO and Virgo decided to release alerts, not to the broad community. So there will be not uh, a open release of this alert, but the alert will be sent only to the groups of astronomers that signed a memorandum of understanding, an agreement with LIGO and Virgo. And uh, this will happen for the first four, event, four, four events. So these four events are events that will be gravitational wave event only on the basis of the gravitational wave data. After these four events, there will be open release of gravitational wave alerts. So everyone can observe these, these alerts. And uh, so we had to call for participation in this program. And one last year, one this year, and now we have about uh, 70 uh, group, 70 institutions that signed an MOU with LIGO Virgo for this science. We have uh, about uh, 150 instruments that cover all the spectrum from very high energy to the radio and uh, that we re receive alerts and that will follow the alerts to try to find the, the counterpart. These are the last slide in which uh, it's a bit of summary in which I say that the, an optimal observational strategy is uh, what we know about uh, GRB and also theory can help us uh, to develop a very good observational strategy. From the point of view of the gravitational wave, for example, it's very important to have a, a very good waveform for the binary system from the theoretical side. And gravitational wave and photons will be necessary to probe single events like GRB, kilonovi, supernovi, pulsars, soft gamma ray repeaters, magnetars. At the same time, they will be very important to study, to make uh, uh, statistical study over population of this object, and for example, to know rates, uh, distribution, demography of compact object. And this will put, uh, will allow us to, to constrain model of birth and evolution of compact object, and uh, for this event to study really for example, as I showed you before, uh, as I told you before, the equation of state of neutron stars. But it is also true that uh, if we open the gravitational wave uh, observation, we expect also exotic sources and also maybe new physics. These are some uh, 
open questions that uh, multi-messenger study can answer. First of all, if uh, a Scherger B is really associated to a binary system, what is, uh, at, for example, the beaming angle of a GRB? If the kilonova can, ex can explain partially the presence of heavy element in the universe, and so on, equation of state, uh, mechanism of explosion of supernovae. And I leave you with these last uh, slides in which uh, I, should, I show you the progress of the, so this is the LIGO. LIGO is in, uh, in a phase of, uh, in which uh, all the parts for the advanced are putting together. And the first science run is in 2016. And this is a, a plot of LIGO taken a uh, few days ago. And so these uh, instruments was uh, first lock uh, Livingston in May and and Enford in March. And uh, lock means that they stay, they observe the sky, not in a science run, but they were able to observe the sky for, for many hours. And uh, the sensitivity of both of them surpassed a lot the initial LIGO and Virgo. And you can see here at what distance they arrived a few days ago that are around 60 megaparsec. So we are really, uh, LIGO is a very, it's very, very promising because it's also more than expected for September. And in September, we will have the, re, the first science run with LIGO. And so this is, this is the last slide that I think is very important because uh, you can see that uh, we can really start observation with the, of a large volume of universe.